Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for waiting, and welcome to the ING Quarter 1 2015 media call. At this moment, all of the participants are in the listen-only mode. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask your questions. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Ralph Hammer, as chairman. Go ahead, please, sir. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us on this call this morning. Uh, what we will discuss this morning is the highlights of our financial achievements and strategic progress for the first quarter of 2015. So with me here are Patrick Flynn, our CFO, and Wilfred Nagel, our CRO. I'm happy to mention that, you know, being the innovative bank as we are, we have a novelty here for today as well. It's the first time that this media call will also be streamed live on Periscope, which is the video streaming uh, service of Twitter. I'm directly looking at the camera now, so I hope it works and that you can all see me. Good. Well, with that, you know, we have a... Uh, uh, we had at least set another standard here. So let's start with the key results of ING Bank in the first quarter. The first quarter 2015 uh, results were strong with an underlying net result of 1,187,000,000, which is up 43% from the first quarter in 2014 and it's more than double that of the fourth quarter 2014. The results were driven by robust growth on the lending book as well as seasonal strong a uh, seasonally strong first quarter of financial markets. The results were strong despite an operating environment that remains challenging. Challenging because it is characterized by the unprecedented uh, low interest rates and the uneven economic recovery that we see. And due to these circumstances, we've been obliged to reduce savings rates as we continue to offer affordable and competitive borrowing. Um, in this climate, we attracted 13.6 billion of net customer deposits and our core lending franchises grew 6.9 billion. All in all, we're on track to deliver our ambition 2017 targets. Our return on equity rose to 12.2% and the cost income ratio improved to 51.7%. Coming to capital, the fully loaded core tier one ratio of ING Bank was stable at 11.4%. Um, which is the result of 40 basis points of capital generation, which we upstreamed, of which we upstreamed 33 basis points to the group. So basically the capital situation of the bank remained stable at a high 11.4%, uh, covering the growth that we have in the lending book, uh, but it's also after the dividend. Um, and the capital uh, situation at the group further improved. Now looking at the highlights for ING Group, uh, in terms of result, the first quarter net result of the group was 1,769,000,000 or 46 cents per share, uh, which includes the result of our insurance stakes. Um, so it's basically the, the net result of the bank, 1,187,000,000 uh, plus the results on the insurance stakes, which gets us to the 1,769,000,000. On divesting those uh, stakes, we continued our progress, as you know. Uh, our holding in NN group was reduced to 54.6% in the first quarter, and we also completed the divestment of Voya, our U.S. insurance company. Now, on the banking side, we also finalized the merger between ING Vaisha and Kotak Mahindra in India. As I already said, you know, the ING Group's capital position further strengthened from the fourth quarter situation with a substantial surplus now in place for evolving regulatory requirements, but also to return capital through attractive dividends. Update on strategy, because these results don't happen uh, just like that. For that, we have to focus on, uh, on improving the services that we uh, deliver to our customers. Um, and that focus is very much embedded in our Think Forward strategy, which is on track. Uh, the Think Forward strategy uh, that is fully focusing on creating a differentiating client experience. And we see that uh, being on track with the innovations that we have uh, introduced in the first quarter again. Uh, apart from the retail innovations in terms of fingerprint technology, video identification of new customers, uh, receiving several awards for being the most innovative bank in many markets in which we're active. We have also now launched a, a digital commercial banking platform, basically a digital platform for our business clients 
to bank with us, getting access uh, to all of their services with ING through a single sign-on, giving real-time information, giving 24-7 uh, service to them uh, across the different countries in which we're active and across the different products that we actually uh, work with them. So that product is called Inside Business. We ran a successful pilot over the last six months and now clearly we are now uh, selling this to more and more customers. It's a real success already there. Then there's another innovation that we are working on, which is the direct lease uh, platform. It's also an online leasing platform, and that will particularly help the SMEs at every step of the leasing cycle. And that will be launched later this year. Um, all of this uh, basically has led also again in the first quarter of this year to uh, a high number of new customers. So we have welcomed more than 350,000 new customers to ING, which is basically a confirmation of the fact that you know, we're very much focused on improving the customer service and the way we deal with customers. Now with that, uh, we're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, we are starting a question and answer session now. If you have a question or remark, please press star one. Star one for questions or remarks. Go ahead. The first question is from Mr. David de Jong from Bloomberg News. Go ahead, sir. Are you on mute? Yeah, David, you're probably on mute because we can't hear you. Uh, you uh, just uh, mentioned in the presentation that uh, regulatory costs are expected to increase 59% this year as opposed to 2014. And then, uh, Patrick, you said in the analyst call that, you know, you clearly hope this is it regarding regulatory costs. I mean, to what, to what extent is that a viable expectation? I mean, is that, is that an aspiration or is that, you know, do you, do you expect that with... Uh, you must have been reading my mind because uh, I, I was thinking, and I hope that's it, but I don't think I said it. Um, <laughs> I said it. Uh, because I said it on the other call right. and I hope this right. is it. But, uh, but Patrick was indicating he was filling in the details. So Patrick, go ahead. So um, you know, our experience has been, unfortunately, that uh, whilst we've hoped that was it, um, it hasn't necessarily always been it. That said, the the major moves that are driving it up, which are you know, it's 250 million increase in one year, which are, is huge, is the you know the DGS schemes. So uh, what's also been, you know, cutting pieces at the edges has been, you know, bank levies in, in different countries. They are a lower order of magnitude. You know, we, we saw that they're in sort of the tens of millions type the range or less. So it's possible you could get more of that or increases of those levies. But I, I would not expect to see, you know, a DGS type size increase, which is, in the, you know, the 200, 250 million order of magnitude to recur. I think you could say with some degree of reasonable hope that that won't recur, but you know, the people topping up, and we're in what, 40 different countries, people topping up uh, local levies possibly may, could happen. Yeah. So basically, uh, David, uh, the, the total uh, expenses on regulatory sites, on regulatory costs, we expect for this year to be around 650. And that's, you know, you can calculate that as a percentage of our profit. It's, it's, it's anywhere between 15% and higher uh, of our profit uh, next to the normal taxes and, and all other duties uh, to be paid. So it's certainly sizable. Uh, it comes from different directions. It's, it's bank taxes. It is uh, DGS schemes. It's a contribution to the single resolution fund uh, that will start to apply as well this year. So it comes from different directions. It comes from different countries. Very clear. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Toby Sterling from Reuters. Go ahead, please, sir. Uh, hi there. I'm just wondering if you can speak in general terms about what you, what, what the bank is doing with its holdings of government bonds. Um, we had a little bit of a, you know, a, a decline off the highs, but I'm just wondering if you're, um, you know, if you're buying, selling, how much you're holding. Yeah. So basically, we we hold bonds for liquidity purposes. So we manage uh, our investment book for liquidity purposes. So it's not like we just sell them um, uh, because we have to replace them with something else that provides for the, with the same liquidity uh, uh, character. 
Um, so we hold them for that purposes. Clearly, you know, when we see an opportunity to sell and, uh, and make a profit and can reinvest in order to, uh, to at least stabilize the return going forward, we will do so, and that's what we have been doing. But we're not en masse now selling the uh, government portfolio just because uh, the ECB is uh, willing to buy or because we see a change in the market happening over the last two weeks. It's just whenever we see the opportunity and can also reinvest, and we can reinvest with the same liquidity uh, characteristic, then uh, we will do so. It looked like you did have some profit taking in Germany, though. Is that right? Yes, exactly. And that's, that's a, a specifically uh, within the framework that I just indicated. You know, we have a liquidity buffer to manage. If we feel that on a particular bond in a particular uh, country, we can uh, we can do that. Uh, we can uh, thereafter do asset swaps or reinvest it in in, in things that give general uh, give uh, similar yields. Uh, we can actually do a good uh, we can actually good do a good deal by taking the profit and still having a good return on uh, on what comes instead of that. Okay. One one other quick question, if I can, is um, on in net in, um, interest margins. Uh, they were better in the Netherlands and and I guess about flat to a little bit better in Germany. What's the long term perspective? Uh, for that, can you continue to, you know, maintain margin in a low rate environment? I think the net income margins also in the Netherlands are more or less, yeah, stable, maybe a little bit better. But, they're, you know, on the savings side, we see a decrease on the margin. We see pressure on the savings side, which is basically normal because we see it everywhere. And the savings rates in the Netherlands are still rather high in comparison to many of the other Euro uh, countries. On the lending side, we see a stabilization of markets, of, 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 of margins as well. Uh, we see a bit of an effect uh, if it comes to uh, margins on mortgages, if it, uh, if it, co if it comes out of the, uh, the prepayment results that we sometimes have in specific countries. We see that in Germany as well. We, uh, we see it a little bit in, uh, we see it in Belgium. Uh, we've seen it in the last quarter of last year, more so in the Netherlands than in the first quarter this year. Uh, and that has a bit of a uptake on margin, but it's not necessarily the margin on new production, uh, which is good, but it's not increasing uh, per se. Okay, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are any further questions or remarks, please press star one, star one for questions and remarks. We have another question from Mr. Leon Williams from Fina Chele Dockblad. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, a question, if I may, about the um, the um, deposit rate in the Netherlands. You've uh, mentioned in your analyst briefing that you uh, will review that and um, uh, possibly uh, lower that, but can you be a little bit more specific in how much you uh, are prepared to lower the deposit rate and uh, by which time? Well, uh, you never know, uh, honestly, but we know that the interest rates are currently very low. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's really an issue of how do you manage your balance sheet, uh, the savings coming in. Uh, it's also a matter of competitive landscape. But we do see that in the surrounding countries that savings rates are far lower than in the Netherlands. And that's why I indicated that I do expect savings rates somewhere in the future to go further down. Uh, exactly when and, and, and how uh, we will see. But uh, at this moment there is no plans that just going by uh, the decrease of interest rates altogether and the, comp and, 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 the, and the landscape in the Eurozone, I do expect uh, more pressure on saving rates, yes, in the Netherlands. Okay. Um, a follow-up question, if I may, on the, on the interest you've mentioned yourself, the, the interest rates are historically uh, very low. Still, your uh, deposits are uh, increasing, I think, by 13 billion. Um, how do you explain that? Uh, people uh, save money. Uh, every every month they have uh, money left over, and they have a couple of choices with that. Either they consume more, and we see some of that now happening. We see consumption in the eurozone increasing year on year. So the first quarter this year versus year, uh, first quarter last year by two two and a half percent. We see the, in the Netherlands we see that increasing by one percent, which in itself is a good sign. So you see more con uh, con uh, uh, consumption. You see a bit of a shift from savings to the uh, investment funds because people effect, uh, expect uh, better yields going in the investment market. You see a bit of a shift of money that they have every uh, that they have left over 
you see that going in prepayments of mortgages, but there's still money left over, so people continue to save. And, um, so, and that's what you see as an inflow. Now, the inflow for IG specifically uh, being so high also has to do with the fact that we attract many more customers. So we have a gain of more than 350,000 new customers this quarter alone. Uh, and that basically shows the attractiveness of our model uh, and also still of, uh, of our rates. Uh, so it's not necessarily that m all people save more with us. It is also that we get many more new clients. So it's a combination of the two. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are any further questions or remarks, please press star one now. Star one for questions. Go ahead. We have another question for Mr. Toby Sterling, Reuters. Go ahead, please. Hi there. It didn't seem like it was a very busy question queue. So, uh, have you guys said anything about when you're going to go below 50% with your um, stakeholding in 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 group? Yeah, Patrick will give an answer to that one. Yeah, we are um, after the last sell down, which brought us to uh, just around 55%. We had a lock up, you know, that were precluded from transacting for three months. That lock up ends uh, at the 20th of this month. Um, and then we would be in an open period uh, where we would be able to uh, transact. So, uh, you know, what you've seen us do before is you know, we've been reasonably expeditious in terms of executing when we had opportunities, uh, um, in part because the windows are, can be very small as they relate to closed periods when results are published and open periods when after they're published. And you also have to marry that up with uh, how attractive the markets are, whether the markets are open or closed to, to transactions. So when we've had the combination of having open periods and open markets, uh, receptive markets, we've, we've transacted. We have a deadline to deconsolidate by the end of this year. That's probably you know, one, possibly two more deals, but hopefully only one will, will do it, bring it to the point where we deconsolidate. And um, you know, assuming that um, we have uh, the combination of attractive markets and open periods, we would look to move uh, to execute uh, on an expeditious, uh, expeditious manner. Okay, and am I right, and do I understand it correctly that that's kind of the last um, thing that would prevent you from uh, engaging in any significant M&A. Um, yeah, I ask because also your capital ratios look um, look strong by European standards. Yeah, the M&A ban uh, will will drop the earlier of November or when we deconsolidate, and uh, I would hope it's the the latter is the earlier the earlier trigger. Right, but have you ruled out any major M&A for this year, or is that open in theory? Uh, we have uh, we just got that answer, uh, that question as well at the uh, on the analyst call. Uh, if you look at our think forward strategy, given the fact that the M&A ban is in place and it was developed under the M&A ban, it's very much driven by organic growth and organic improvement plans across the different geographies and the business lines in which we're active. <coughs> now, uh, where we see that either a merger or a small acquisition uh, could help us improving our positions. As part of that sustainable share analysis, we would certainly uh, uh, take a look at it. Uh, for example, uh, we just executed the merger in India between ING Vaisha and Kotak Mahindra. And the reason for us to, uh, to actually do that is that our organic growth plan uh, was promising, but we could accelerate the, uh, the shareholder value as well as improve the customer services to our international companies as well as the local companies. By, by that merger, and therefore we followed the route of a merger to further improve our position in, in India. And that is what you can expect from us uh, if it comes to in-country consolidation in the markets in which we're active. If in-country consolidation is happening, we have to keep our eyes open as to how that will affect our own position, uh, whether we should consider to play or not. And uh, so that's the way we will go about it. Thanks much. Ladies and gentlemen, for further questions or remarks, press star 1. We have another question from Leon Williams from Financial Aid Upload. Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Hamas, uh, if I may, um, I'm trying to establish whether the, the uh, expansion in, in, in lending is really lending as in giving companies the opportunity to invest or that it's more of a, 
uh, let's say, a financial uh, transaction, uh, I mean um, an investment transaction. For instance, in Germany, you mentioned in the, um, in the release that customer lending is increased by $4 billion, but uh, that, that total amount is, um, uh, is, is an increase in bank treasury products. Uh, can you explain that, please? Yeah, so basically, if you take a look at the core lending, uh, this is 6.9 billion that I uh, have mentioned, and that is also in the press release. That is um, on slide six of the presentation that we released, and that's basically where you see the lending coming in. And that's uh, uh, slide eight. So my, my glasses are not even working. <laughs> oh, the print is too small. One of the two. Small. Uh, the print is too small. Okay, good. Uh, so basically, that's where you see how the lending is divided over the countries. So that is excluding the growth in bank treasury, which is, uh, which is another point. But the actual lending that we have announced is 6.9 billion is true lending. So what do you see happening there? It is uh, the 6.9. You can um, cut in two pieces. It's around uh, 2 billion, 2.1 billion in what we would call retail across uh, the different activities in which we're active. So consumer lending, so mortgage growth, SME growth uh, uh, across the different uh, countries. And there is 4.6 billion of growth in the commercial banking area, which are also companies. Uh, and that you can divide between two. One is 2.2 billion growth in industry lending and structured finance which is basically really supporting major investments in oil and gas, power, infrastructure, uh, and companies active in those, uh, in those sectors. And it's 2.4 billion of working capital solutions, as well as transaction services, which is truly financing companies and the growth of these companies. So the 6.9 billion that we have announced as the growth of our core lending is true lending into the economy. And that's different from the uh, bank treasury uh, increase, where there is also customer lending, but that is more that is that is customer lending on the back of the increase of our funding uh, basis. Uh, uh, so, but the 6.9 that you refer to is true, true business lending. Okay, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, for further questions or remarks, press star one. Star one for questions or remarks. Go ahead. Chairman, we have no further questions at this time. Okay, if there's no further questions on the line, I'm checking with Raymond whether there's any questions coming in from the Periscope yep. side. No? Okay, good. Okay, then I'd like to wrap up this call. Thanks for, uh, for participating in the call. Uh, we're very proud of uh, the results of this quarter in a challenging environment, economically uh, uncertain, as well as low interest rate environment, I think that we pulled off a very good result in the first uh, quarter, um, continuing on our strategy, delivering our strategy, getting more than 350,000 new customers, and that then resulting into uh, 6.9 billion of extra lending and 13, uh, more than 13 billion of extra savings. Um, I think that shows the model that we uh, adhere to, which is we play in this environment by taking savings out of the economies and replenish them into the economies, supporting the growth of these economies. So we're quite happy with that result in the first quarter. Thanks for uh, participating, uh, and I hope to talk to you uh, in a, on the next occasion. Thank you very much. The conference is no longer being recorded.